Welcome everyone to a talk homology on uh, November 10th, 2020. So last time uh, we began the discussion of Planck duality and I sketched the construction. Uh, if X is a smooth variety over a field K of dimension D, sorry, here K is separably closed. Uh, then I, I sketched a construction between H2D compact support X and then lambda of D, I'll say in a second what lambda is. So, so I construct a, a, a trace map um, between this thing and um, just lambda or right here, lambda is uh, the sheaf, um, the constant sheaf Z mod L to the MZ or ZL or QL here, we're thinking of these as, these aren't sheaves, these are ZL sheaves or QL sheaves, meaning a ZL sheaf, remember is an inverse system of, of sheaves. So, so we constructed, a, we constructed a, an isomorphism like this. Um, so this was an isomorphism. Um, and so today uh, I'm gonna use this, I'm gonna sketch um, how we're going to use this um, for to, to, to construct kind of punk duality. And then and then um, I'm going to sketch the proof of the left shed's fixed point formula. And that will be uh, a conclusion actually. Of, of the, all the preliminaries we need to start getting at the Vey conjectures. So uh, assuming I finish these today, we're gonna start proving the Vey conjectures next time or even maybe at the end of today. Um, so in particular uh, with this and the finiteness theorems we've already proven, um, doing uh, the rationality and, and functional equation like in the first couple lectures of the course will be not very hard. Um, and then the Riemann hypothesis will take a, a lot of time. All right, so are there are there any questions about that before we continue? Okay, so so what's the let me first recall the statement of Poincare duality. So at least the simplest statement was that there was a cup product map from HI compact support X uh, lambda of D times H2 D minus I of X without compact support, lambda to H2 D. So this is a cup product map. Uh, compact support of X with coefficients in lambda of D. And we just said that this is canonically isomorphic via this trace map to lambda. Um, and the statement was that uh, if, if, so this, this makes sense in general, and the statement was that if lambda is QL, this is a nice morph, this is a perfect pairing. So in general, the, the obstruction to it being a perfect pairing is some torsion stuff. There's still some torsion version of Poincare duality, which I'll say a word about. Uh, but but this is what we'll actually use when we when we prove the Vey conjectures, which are just about the Vey conjectures are just about rational cohomology since they're about the traces of some operators acting on cohomology. Um, so so this is all we're going to care about later on. But I'll, I'll say a word about the torsion situation since uh, Ben asked about it a bit in office hours. Okay, so so what's the idea? So I'm only going to sketch the idea because this is a, a very involved proof. So the idea is actually to to. To, to find a relative version of this. So to find a relative version uh, which is called Verdier duality. So, so um, just a reminder, so there's um, there's some some categories we we've I've only very imprecisely described, which are the derived categories of of um, of constructible sheaves on X. 
So suppose, um, suppose we have a morphism f from x to y. This is just a morphism of k varieties. And this works in more generality than, than k varieties, but um, we're only going to use it for varieties. So then, then there's a map, our f lower shriek from the derived category of constructible sheaves. I'll, I'll say what this means in a second on X to the derived category of constructible sheaves on Y. So, so just a reminder, I sort of briefly discussed this. So this is, um, this is you take the category of complexes of, ab of abelian sheaves. So our category of bounded complexes of abelian sheaves on the atoll site. And formally invert quasi isomorphisms. And these, these complexes have to satisfy an additional property. They have to have constructible cohomology. Okay, so, so loosely speaking, what you should think of, of these, these complexes as is they're, so they're complexes of abelian sheaves, which are built out of constructible sheaves. So in particular, their homology sheaves are constructible. Um, and then we're only viewing them up to, up to quasi-isomorphism. So if you haven't seen the derived category, this is, this is a, a very, very sketchy introduction. If you've had seen the derived category of an abelian category, that's what this is. So you take the category of bounded complexes of, of abelian sheaves with constructible cohomology sheaves, and then formally invert quasi-isomorphisms. So, so what's the benefit of this? So the, the benefit of this category is that it, uh, it lets one um, study the sort of total derived functors. So, so here, this is a, this is a, a, a functor which takes a, a sheaf on X, for example, or a complex of sheaves, and then sends it to a, a complex computing um, as the cohomology sheaves, the, the derived shriek push forwards. Of the, of the complex you started with on X. So for example, if you started with an honest sheaf here, what would this functor be? Well, you'd extend your sheaf by zero to a relative compactification of X. You'd take an uh, injective resolution of it, and then you'd take the derived, you'd take the push forward of that injective resolution, and that's all it would be. So this, this what this says is like, oh, well, that operation, which involves a choice, namely the choice of injective resolution, actually gives you a well-defined functor once you invert the, the sort of things your choice is up to, namely quasi-isomorphisms. So are there, are there any questions about what I mean by this, this map here? I'm happy to talk more about it. And I know that was a very fast introduction to it. So if you have questions, now's your chance. Why do you take complexes of sheaves with constructible cohomology and not complexes of constructible sheaves? That's a good question. So. Um, as far as I know, it's at least not obvious to me that those two categories are equivalent. Um, the the most the the reason this is con a convenient thing to do is um, when you compute these derived functors like RF lower star say, you take an injective resolution, right? And those injective sheaves aren't that you you use are not constructible. I see. So you want to have like enough um, acyclics. In yeah, that's category. right. That's right. Yeah. So, so it, there are a lot of situation. I mean, so, so the actual construction or definition of the derived category doesn't require that. So, so usually what it does is it lets you actually define these functors. There are actually a lot of situations. Um, and I think this is not one of them in general, but there are a lot of situations where um, you can kind of use the smaller category um, and you end up getting an equivalent derived category, but it's it, like, for example, um, if you have an honest scheme, if you have a scheme, you can look at the category of the derived category of complexes of coherent sheaves, or you can look at the derived category of abelian sheaves with coherent cohomology. And those are not always equivalent, but in, in good cases, like for varieties over a field, they are equivalent. Um, okay, but thanks. but in, in sort of general situations, the, the sort of safe thing to do is always to take a category of complexes in a, in a big, in a, in a sort of very like floppy, situation like all abelian sheaves and just put restrictions on their cohomology. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Are there any other questions about this? Okay, so the the idea so the idea 
now will be to construct a right adjoint. To um, our F lower shriek. So this is something that in general only exists on the level of derived categories. So so um, so this will be this will be a what, what what we'll call F upper shriek, and this will be a map from the category. Well, this is called the constructible derived categories. That's what I'll just refer to it as. So the constructible derived category on Y to the, the constructible derived category on X. So this is step one. We'll, one will con construct a sort of right adjoint in general. Um, and then step two is to, um, is to actually compute it. So compute that if F is smooth of pure dimension D, then this F upper shriek fun functor applied to a, a sheaf or a complex F will be F twisted by D and then in degree 2D. Okay, and then, and then three, so this adjointness is going to imply, this is, this is more or less an unwinding of what adjointness is gonna mean, that if one computes R, F lower star of the derived hom functor of uh, F into F upper shriek of G. Sorry, this is really crazy, but I'm going to work out an example in a second. This is going to be, uh, there will be a canonical, sorry, a canonical equivalence of bifunctors, if you'd like, into R hom. So here this is in. D C of X, and this is in D C of Y of R F lower shriek of F with coefficient uh, mapping to G. Okay, so this is some crazy stuff. Let me let me briefly indicate why this implies um, why this implies Poincaré duality. So what does this have to do? do with Poincaré duality. Okay, so uh, so so the the idea is very simple. So the idea is you take uh, X to be a, any smooth variety, Y to be a point, and uh, F and G to be uh, sheaves lambda. To be to be a constant sheaf. So you think lambda is QL, but I, I want to write it in. So this is this is a constant sheaf. So you should think lambda is QL, but but I want to write it in this generality because it will let me make some remarks about like what happens with torsion and that kind of thing. So so what happens? So then we get a we get an if you believe this adjointness, so we get an isomorphism, R F lower star, R hom. So our hom just means the derived functor of hom. So it's cohomology sheaves or X sheaves. So now we get lambda, then F, F upper shriek of lambda here. So what was F upper shriek of lambda in the smooth setting? This was just lambda twisted by D in degree minus 2D. So this, this shift here means we put it in degree minus 2D. And then this was supposed to be isomorphic to our hom this is now on the point, so I can erase the underline. It's just R hom um, of lambda, sorry, of R F lower shriek of lambda into lambda. Okay, so so what happens? Um, so so what is this top thing? So this this top thing is is pretty understandable. This is just the so so this this R hom here. So let me highlight it maybe. This arham here, so this is just arham from the constant thing into a twist of the constant thing is just a, a twist of the constant thing in, in some degree. So this is this is our f lower star of uh, what is it lambda of d twisted by uh, in degree minus two d. 
So in other words, this is this sum this computes this computes uh, the cohomology. So H uh, two D minus I, if you'd like. Uh, sorry, H. Yeah, this computes H H. Wait, sorry, let me just quickly check which direction it is. Yeah, so in negative degree, so in in degree in degree, this is this the cohomology of this in degree i is h uh, negative two d plus i of x with coefficients in um, wait sorry this is in negative degrees sorry it's it's it computes h i plus two d of uh, x with coefficients in lambda of d. So this is cohomology in negative degrees. So it, its cohomology runs from h minus 2d to h0. So what about this thing? So the cohomology here, uh, well, there's a spectral sequence computing this, which goes from x to i of, well, our f lower shriek of lambda is just the compactly supported cohomology of um, of x with coefficients in lambda, but then we're mapping that into lambda. Okay, so if lambda is just QL, so what happens? So if lambda is just QL, then this x term vanishes, and what we get is a isomorph we get a isomorphism between the dual of H j x lambda uh, with compact support. And H, uh, let's see, J minus 2D of X lambda of D. Um, and I think I'm probably missing a minus sign here because of the dual. So I think this is a, a minus J. Yeah, that's right. So, th th so this is just Poincare duality. Now, of course, there's a bit of content here. So, so first of all, you have to, to unwind the pairing here. With this, this isomorphism gives one a pairing between this and this, right? And one has to compare that to the cup product. That's a highly non-trivial thing to do. Um, and then, and then one has to check compatibility with under that, that comparison with the trace map. Um, all right. So let me just briefly remark. So what happens for like lambda is ZL? So for lambda ZL, you get a, a special sequence. So X I of uh, H with compact support J X lambda. And this converges to the thing on the right, which was H, uh, I think we get I minus J plus 2D of um, X lambda of D. So, so what's happening here? So some of these pieces are, are torsion. Um, so, so, so when when this group has some torsion, then x one is non-zero. Um, and if, if lambda is z mod l to the n, things can get a lot more complicated. So, in in that case, the, these groups can be non-zero for infinitely many i. All right. Are there any questions about that? So this is this is kind of a general procedure for for studying um, the versions of Poincaré duality. So, for example, there's a version of Verdier du duality in topology. Um, so, for for nice maps of spaces, like not just manifolds, there's a version of this f upper shriek functor, and it and it lets one kind of have a version of Poincaré duality on on pretty general topological spaces. So it, this is a really, I mean, it's a very beautiful theory, um, and I, I encourage you to to look at it. So the 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 place where it's computable is this in the smooth setting. So in, in, in topology for manifolds, when this up, f upper shriek has a, has a nice form. Um, okay, so so let me say a, a few words about these constructions because they're they're not at all trivial and and I mean there's like books written about this. It, it's not um, it's it's not uh, you know I could teach a whole course on this. Um, but, but what have we bought ourselves? So what we've bought ourselves is, is we've bought ourselves some room to actually construct this F, F upper shriek. So in particular, uh, suppose we can write F as like a composition of two maps. So like H and G, 
then if we can construct H upper shriek and G upper shriek, uh, then, then we can construct a, a F upper shriek as their composition, as the composition. So what this lets us do is it lets us as reduce things to the case of relative curves, which is, is basically the, basically the, the benefit. So, so what's the, what's the, let me just say, a, so that's actually the original construction, but let me just say a bit about the modern um, construction. Of f upper shriek, so this is is due to due to Neiman. So this is for for general f. So the idea is to use use uh, Brown representability. So what what that is is it's a general criterion for when a functor. Um, on a, on a sort of homotopy theoretic category. So for example, like in a model theoretic setting or in a triangulated setting is representable. And, and what you do is you just figure out, so, so what do you wanna do? You wanna, you wanna figure out, so what is the functor? So what is the, the functor um, into F upper shriek of G? And, and well, we know what it is, it's equal to, um, of uh, f star dash into g more or less like this is what it means to be adjoint so this should be sorry r f star into g so this is what it means to be adjoint um so so what one needs to do is one just needs to check that this functor satisfies the the conditions of the brown representability theorem so so one checks that this is representable and there's an abstract way to do that. And now, now one just has to compute what it is. So now one has to compute it for, um, for F smooth. And the idea is to reduce to the following situation. So one reduces to the case where F from X to S is smooth of relative dimension one. Um, and uh, so your sheaf F here is constant so that you can do by taking a resolution. Um, well, and some other divisage. Uh, so G you take to be constructible Okay, and, and then and then this is in some sense a direct computation. It's still a highly non-trivial computation. Like it's it's very closely related to what we already did for, for curves. But but one simple, so one simple uh, trick is that at least if S is the point, we can can actually reduce to the situation over C. So, so why is that? Well, we've already proven a bunch of comparison theorems between atelic homology in this kind of setting on, uh, and, and, and the analytic situation. And if you have a curve over point, you can always like lift to characteristic zero and then pass to the complex numbers. So, so in some sense, these, these computations are like, you don't have to use analytic methods, but, but at least some of it can be simplified if you do. Um, cool. Okay, so so once you compute for a relative curve, then then at least locally you can write any map as a composition of, of relative curves, or any smooth map as a composition of relative curves, uh, and then and then you win. Uh, there's there's some there's some non-trivial details in actually, like this is not quite a local statement because it's in the derived category, but but at least for smooth morphisms, since everything is like this f upper shriek is actually an honest, you can you can write it as an honest functor, not just on the derived category, like we said. We said f upper shriek of f is just f of d. Well, then there's the shift, but let me ignore that for a second. Like this is th at least this part. Sorry, there should be an f upper star here. At least this part makes sense. Um, not not in the derived category. Like somehow the gluing the gluing uh, Im implicit in checking this locally is not not actually very challenging. All right, are there are there any questions about that? That was a very very sketchy. Uh, intro to 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 punk radiality.
So, so you should ask lots of questions. Well, Lambda isn't actually a sheaf, right? It's like the inverse system of sheaves. That's right, yeah. So when we're taking X of it, what does that exactly mean? Yeah, so so the way I wrote here, so I wrote when I wrote this, I, I wrote it in the derived category of honest constructible sheaves of of so that this all makes sense when lambda is just C mod L to the NZ. Um mm -hmm. and then making the derived category of elatic sheaves is really challenging. So so um right, but you said something like X, you know, vanishes in. Uh, uh, I just do what you're saying. Right? Yeah, so, like, that's not going to. So that that was in the case where where we have a, this is this is over a point here. So then there's no actual issue, okay. right? This this x is in this is in the derived category of a point, which is just the same as the category of DL modules. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so you're right that strictly speaking, this is not. Um, if you think of it as sheaves on the point, it's not. Uh, it's not a category. It's not a category of sheaves, but if you just, it's the derived category of a category, which is equivalent to the category of of con, like continuous ZL modules. So you're saying that the cohomology of ZL on a point is just like the same thing as taking, yeah, okay, is the direct limit, but you can just put the direct limit inside because. Yeah, different. that's right. That's right. Yeah, I mean, it's it's not it's not the sorry. What uh, maybe I should be a little clearer. So this is not the category when when you take compute this X, it's not in the category of discrete ZL modules. It's in the category of topological ZL modules. So there's still right. a little bit of subtlety, but but yeah. But what what the, the statement is that the category of ZL sheaves on the point is equivalent to the category of topological ZL modules. Mm -hmm. So if, if you believe you can take X of topological ZL modules, then, then you should just think in that category. But I, I actually do think that's subtle. Like it's not, it's not, um, it's not a totally trivial thing to do. But yeah, that's a good question. Well, how Other do you question? take X of topological ZL modules? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, Yeah, so one thing you can do is, uh, yeah, so what's the simplest thing to say? I mean, yeah, I guess what I would say is the, the simplest thing to say is that you can just define things in terms of free resolutions, which is not so hard for ZL modules. Um, if you want like a really good theory I don't think you can avoid um, at least some of the pain involved in making derived categories of elatic sheaves. So, so what you do there is you take a kind of, uh, you, you work with the derived category of Z mod L to the NZ modules and then take a kind of inverse limit, but it's, it's a little subtle, subtle what that actually means. I guess I'm not entirely sure. Wait, so topological Z, ZL modules, do those even form in a billion category? Um, let me think about that. I think in at least for finitely generated ones they do. I would have to think a little bit in general. It's a good question. Yeah, they certainly form an exact category, which is is all you need, but it's okay. Yeah. yeah. So Jose asks if step one is to produce prove the relative trace map is an isomorphism. So I kind of sketched that last time. So so here I I was construct explaining how to how to continue. So step one was just to construct this this red adjunct functor. Does that answer your question, Jose? Great. Other other questions? Yeah. So I'm sorry I'm going through so quickly through this. Like I think this is not uh, this is this is quite hard stuff. All right. So so let me mention a couple corollaries here. So, so the first corollary is that um, that if if X is a smooth variety of dimension D, H I of X equals zero. Or really, we can put anything here. Here, this is any constructible thing uh, for I bigger than two D. Can anyone prove the corollary for me? It's 
dual to something in negative degree. Yeah, exactly right. So it's, it's dual to something in negative degree. We could have, I and mean, this is, I think, traditionally proven, I mean, this is true for non-smooth varieties in general, also in negative degree. But but this gives a cheap proof. So so the remark is that this is actually true for arbitrary varieties. Um, of dimension D, but the, the proof is, is very non-trivial. So it, it relies on some really like non-trivial Galois cohomology computations. Um, so the, like the idea you want to do is you want to try to fiber in curves and then argue that we know that the, the what the, the cohomological dimension of, of curves is, but, but there's some, there's some subtleties that, that mean working in that relative situation is a little harder. Um, yeah, so, but this at least gives us a cheap proof for smooth varieties. Um, Do we need the field to be algebraically closed? Uh, yeah, 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 sorry, this is smooth variety. But yeah, I mean, that was the setting for the, that we needed that for Poincare duality too, but yeah. So, so this is, this is over a separately closed field. Yeah, so the settings were over a separately closed field and then uh, lambda is, or F, F here is, has the, the coefficients are prime to the characteristic. Yeah, the orders of the stocks are, are prime to the characteristic. Yeah, so maybe let me just give you kind of a, a, a sort of non-example. So the, the non-example is that if you have a, for a curve over a finite field, um, H, H3, so let's call it X. So H3, uh, let's say compact support, of x lambda is in general non-zero, or is is non-zero like maybe I guess if I if I put a, a one here, this is always true. Yeah. So this is this is some kind of in, in general for finite fields, there's some kind of Poincaré duality in dimension two D plus one. Um, so that's that's where this is coming from. Cool. Um, so are there, are there any questions about that or about anything we've talked about so far? Where did you use algebraically closed in the proof? Yeah, so, so it was in the construction of the trace map. So we, um, I see. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. At some point we reduced to the case of curves and then we used that our computation for curves over algebraically closed field. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, and I mean, of, of course, like, I think it's not so hard to see you need some some condition on algebraic closeness, like if x is a point, then, uh, you know, like, like field, Galois homology in general doesn't satisfy um, Poincaré duality. Although sometimes Galois homology has kind of duality features. Okay, sorry, actually, you, in your proof using Verdier duality, we didn't really use the trace map. Can we just see where in there we need yeah, so so let's see what happened here. So here, um, yeah. Is it when we go to the point? Because we need that point to be a. Yeah, that's that's right. So what do we see? Yeah, so so when here where we used algebraic closes, I mean somehow the trace map is included in in this in this. If you like stare, if you put take lambda to be lambda. Of, D um, and and stare at what you get here. You'll you'll see that the the trace map just pops out. But what we needed is that that chiefs on the point are just honest are honest modules, not Galois modules. So that's that's where we used it. I'm just trying to see what fails if they're Galois modules. Yeah, I mean, so so you still get a statement like this, but this this x die is in the category of Galois modules. I see. Okay. No. Right. So you're saying that that doesn't reduce to just the dual when it's right, right, right. So, so what you, for example, in just x zero would be hom of Galois modules. So it would only pick up kind of the co the Galois co invariance in here. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? These are great questions, by the way. 
All right, so so if not, I want to uh, let's maybe take a, a three minute break actually, because I'm about to start talking about the left shuts fixed point formula. Um, so this is a good stopping point. Um, so yeah, so how's everyone doing? All right, no comment. Do you guys do you guys actually want to break? Good to hear, Freddie. All right, let's talk a bit about the left shift fixed point formula then. So, so what's the setting? So suppose X is smooth and projective. We don't actually need a projective, but I'll, I'll state things in this, this setting for now over a separably closed field. And uh, suppose phi is a map from x to x. Then the theorem, and I'll, I'll discuss what this means in, in a little second, is that if we take the graph of phi, and intersect it with the diagonal. So here, this is the diagonal inside of x cross x. And this graph of phi is also inside of x cross x. So this, this is, uh, if you'd like, an intersection product in, in, uh, in the chow ring. But I'll, I'll say, I'll say a, a sort of another way of making sense of it that we already know. Um, so this is the sum uh, of from i equals uh, 0 to 2d of negative one to the i trace of um, phi star acting on the atoll homology of x. Great. OK, so, so what does this mean? So, so here, there's, there's two ways of, of understanding this. So here, gamma phi dot delta. So this is a, an intersection of two cycles of co-dimension uh, equal to dim x in x times x. So which, which means its intersection is, is a cycle class of, of co-dimension 2 max, so namely a, a zero cycle. Um, so this, this mean, when I write this, I mean the, so maybe I should write the degree here. Of this. So, so, the, so the degree of this is a number. So we, we haven't discussed uh, Chow theoretic intersections in this course. So there's a there's another way of of getting at the, these, which is which is in fact what we'll use uh, in the proof. Um, so so in this class, we can think of this as uh, the trace of the class, the cycle class of gamma phi, copped with the cycle class of delta. So this is this here is in. Um, H, uh, H, uh, let's see, um, four dim x, this is the top cohomology of x times x, of x times x with coefficients in um, QL of two dim x. And, uh, then, and then there's a trace map from this to QL. Okay, and then the the non the non obvious thing is that these two things agree. So that that follows from, for example, the the cycle class map being a, a homomorphism of rings, um, but uh, but um, which which I, I I'm not able to prove in this class unfortunately. Um, so but but at least for from the point of view of of proving this theorem, we're just good. We can just think of it this way. Um, so are there are there any questions about the statement? So yeah, so so what is the the simplest way to understand this is in the situation where where phi is kind of um, yeah. So let me maybe draw a picture actually. So here's x cross x. Here's the diagonal. 
this is the diagonal, then uh, the graph of a map looks something like this. So what is what is the what are these intersection points? These are the fixed points. So in the situation where there are, are finitely many fixed points, um, then then we can just compute this intersection like literally by intersecting with and counting multiplicities of intersections. Um, and then this says literally. So what you're supposed to think is that this is kind of the the number of fixed points. So so in general, um, in general, like like if you have a random map phi, like the identity map, for example, this this intersection doesn't have to have the right dimension. So so for example, one one corollary. So one corollary of this is that if you take the diagonal dotted with itself, so the degree of this intersection, this is something that makes sense in the showering or in cohomology, for example, this is equal to the Euler characteristic of the cohomology of X with two coefficients, right? Because in that case, you get this, the, the diagonal is the, the graph of the identity map. So then you get the trace of the identity, which is the, just the dimension of these groups. Um, so, so we're going to apply this later on. So, so maybe the. Wait, can I just interrupt uh, for a moment? Uh, what? Can you can you specify what what maybe I missed the 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 hypotheses? What is X here? Like, what is the ground field? For it's a smooth projective variety over a separably closed field, and and I should say, uh, L is not equal to the characteristic of K. So we're allowing characteristic zero here. Yeah, okay. for sure. Yeah, so 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 the the remark is that even though we're allowing characteristic zero here, uh, the remark is that that this will apply this this uh, when phi is the that is the Frobenius map, it's relative Frobenius, or really well, actually really absolute Frobenius. All right, um, so, so then the fixed points of Frobenius will be literally the rational points of a, a variety of a finite field. Are there, are there any questions about this? Okay, so, um, so in order to, to describe this, I need to tell you a little bit about Geissen maps. in order to sketch the proof of this. So, so let me remind you a little bit about the, uh, about the, the functoriality. So given a map pi from y to x, which is proper, and suppose we have a proper map and x and y are smooth varieties, we'll, we'll later apply this to phi, so, so where phi is a map from, from x to itself. Um, so, so in this setting, um, we're going to get a, a, a sort of dual map, right? So maybe let me assume uh, for, for a second that x and y are also proper. So then we get a, we get a, a push forward map on cohomology, namely um, a push forward map from hr of y with coefficients in lambda to h uh, r minus 2c of x with coefficients in lambda twisted by minus c. So this is uh, here, here um, where c is the uh, relative dimension of f, or sorry, of pi rather. So, so by, by that, I mean, um, I mean, C is uh, the dimension of, of uh, I guess, dimension of Y minus dimension of X. Um, okay, so, so how do we get this? Well, we just literally, so, so what, what is this? This is, this is just dual to pi upper star. Okay, so, so what properties does this map have? So let me 
first just tell you the defining property. So, so what does it mean to be the dual of a, of a map? So just the definition is as follows. So it's that if you if you've um, y and h, uh, I guess r of uh, y and x in let's see which one does it have to be um, h two dim y minus r of x, then uh, well, what did we say? We say that when we apply pi star to x and cup with y, the, the value of our pairing, which is just trace of the cup product, has to equal, so this is this is the trace on x, has to equal the trace on y of uh, x cupped with pi upper star of y. So this is just what it means to be a, a, dual, a dual map. So it means that when you pair, um, after using your map, that's the same as as pairing after after pulling back through the, the dual map, right? So this is literally the definition of push forward. Okay. the The next property is that um, if if y is a closed immersion, so if pi is a closed immersion. then um, pi star of one is just the class of y. So the cycle class. So this is this boils down to unwinding definition. Yes. Um, okay, three, this follows from the functoriality of trace and the cup product. Um, if you push forward through a composition, that's the same as composing push forwards. So, so four is a projection formula. So, pushing forward a cup product of some of, with the with the pullback is the same as um, pi star of y cup x. So this is called the projection formula. And then uh, one more property is that then this is not not totally trivial. So if pi is finite. Um, of degree D, and this is true in a bit more generality, but but I'll state it in this generality. So it's it's true as long as as the if pi is proper and the and the relative degree and the sort of generic degree is D. So the degree of function field extensions is D. Then if you pull back and then push forward, uh, this is just uh, D um, times the identity. Okay, so so how do you prove all of these things? So one is literally just the definition of a dual map, and then the the rest of these things follow follow from one. So the the only one that's contentful, meaning is is this is this five. Um, so so here, what you have to do is you have to figure out what um, what uh, a map of degree d does um, on on top cohomology. So that's kind of the content. So so you have to understand how it interacts with trace. Um, Great. Are there are there any questions about that? Cool. All right. So so let's um, let me let's let's go back to to this. I'll I'll. Yeah, so so maybe maybe I'll remark. I mean, so so in general, so in general, so here I, I describe what happens if um, so if, if um, x and y are not proper. So I describe what happens in the proper setting, just so I don't have to write a lot of uh, subscripts. But in, in general, you get a, a map. Um, you get a map um, between cohomology of, with compact support. So you get a map pi star. HR compact support of Y with coefficients in lambda to H um, R minus two C compact support of X with coefficients in lambda twisted by minus C. Where again, remember minus C C was the relative dimension. Um, 
And then also uh, similarly, so if, if X is smooth, but not proper, so there's, there's some subtlety in defining this, but there's a, a Lefschetz formula uh, with, with compact support, compactly supported cohomology. So the subtlety is that we didn't define cycle classes in, in this setting. So, so I, I can't actually state the theorem for you with what we've already developed. But, um, but, but there, is, there is such a theorem and I'll, I'll state it, I mean, I'll state it at least in the case where phi is Frobenius later on. Okay, um, so, so maybe, uh, maybe before proving the Lefschetz formula, let's actually just do a couple examples. So, so here we can actually see it's true already um, for, for, for some examples given what we've already computed. Um, in ideal cohomology. So, so let's just consider the case where X is P1 um, uh, over a separately closed field. So what are, what are your, some of your favorite maps from P1 to itself? As X goes to X to the N. Yeah, that goes just to the end. It's great. So let's call phi x goes just to the n. So so let's compute first. So how many fixed points does phi have? So what is what is the intersection between the graph of phi and the diagonal? Anyone? So, so maybe let me assume the characteristic of K is zero just to, to make things simpler. Otherwise some, some kind of funky stuff can happen maybe. Just one. Is it just one? Oh, sorry, the N minus one at the roots of UMT or something? I thought N at no, N. Yeah, any thoughts from anyone else? So we're looking at, so it's a fixed point is, is a point such that X equals X to the N, right? So how many of those are there? Yeah, it's just the N minus one at the roots of unity and zero. And zero, okay, yeah. So there is, um, oh, there's one more. And infinity. And infinity, yeah. So there's this, so it's zero mu, n minus one and infinity. So, okay, we found this n plus one of them. So here, this, this makes sense. Uh, so, okay, there's a little content here. You have to compute the multiplicity, um, but, but uh, it's not so bad. So, so what, what is the multiplicity? So we have to compute, well, we're looking at x to the n minus x equals zero. And in characteristic zero, this is a separable polynomial. It has no double roots. So, so we just get n plus one here. I mean, you also have to do the same check with infinity, but it's you just replace x with one over x, and then you get literally the same computation. Okay, so n plus one is here. So let's compare this now to the sum of uh, negative one to the i. So we go from i equals zero to two of the trace of phi on h i of p one with coefficients in QL. So. Um, so, so how do we do this? So this is just, um, there's no H1, right? So this is the trace of phi on H0, P1 QL, uh, plus the trace of phi on H2 of P1 QL. So uh, let's compute that. So, so what do we get on H0? So what is, sorry, this should be phi pullback. So what do we get on H0? So what does phi do on H0 of P1? So H0 of P1 is just what? QL? Yeah, so it's just QL, right? And what does what does phi do to it? So we're looking at 
uh, sections. So this is just sections to the constant QL sheaf, if you'd like. So what happens to such a section if you pull it back through fee? Is it still just x goes to x to the n? Uh, what is x here? I mean, the section composed. Yeah, so, so, so phi is acting on P1, right? It's not acting on the coefficients, right? So if you've, you've uh, if you'd like you to have a map, let's just think of a finite level. So if you think about z mod L to the nz, so you have a map from P1 to z mod L to the nz. So that's a constant map, right? And now what is this doing? It's you're pre-composing with phi. So you send P1 to itself and then to z mod L to the n. So what happened, what map do you get to z mod L to the nz when you do that? The same constant map. Yeah, yeah. So here we just get the identity. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry, Evan. I, I missed that you wouldn't mind a break. So we'll, once we finish this example, we'll do a break, a, a short break. Uh, well, we're almost out of time, but we'll see. We'll do a short break, maybe. Um, okay. Uh, so what about H2? So how, how do we do H2? Any thoughts? So how did we understand H2 of a curve? So let's just remember. So H2. A P1 with, uh, well, we can just, we're in characteristic zero, so it doesn't matter whether we do Z, or we're over an algebraically closed field rather, so it doesn't matter whether we do Z mod L to the NZ or, or Z mod L or, or mu L to the NZ. So let's put a mu L to the N here. So, so this was the co-kernel of the map from pick P1 to pick P1 given by uh, sending a line bundle to its uh, L to the nth power. So that tells us that H2 of P1 QL, well, after, after you choose an isomorphism between QL and QL of one, is just the, uh, the inverse limit for N of these co-kernels. This is just multiplication by L to the N, answered with QL, right? This is the definition of of atel cohomology with QL coefficients or really QL of one coefficients. Okay, so, so what does phi do to this? So in order to figure this out, we have to figure out what phi does to a line bundle, right? So what does what does phi, what does X goes to X to the end do to a line bundle? Anyone? So what is what is what what happens when you pull back the line middle O of one on P one through through the map back? It tensors it with itself n times. Uh yeah, that's that's right. So yeah, so it's multiplication by n. Um so let me let me I'll say a word about what. So this phi is just is just multiplication by n on pick what on pick. And hence on, hence by what well, the formula we wrote down, hence on um, H2, P1, QL. So here we get a one plus N and one plus N is, is exactly this N plus one here. Okay, so, so we figured it out. Okay, so let me just briefly say a word about why, um, why this, is, this is right. So, so what happens, like, how do you write down a line bundle on, on P1? You cover by A1s and then you write down a transition function, right? Which is a function on, on GM, if you'd like. And so pulling back through, and then, then the degree of your line bundle is like the, the degree of that transition function, right? Um, like, a, yeah, that's really, yeah. So, so what happens here while well, you're, you're, you are plugging in an X to the N into that transition function. So it increases the, it multiplies the degree by N. Great. So can you explain how, if you know that it's modification by N and the trace of that is equal to N? Uh, 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 sorry, you have a, uh, this is a one dimensional vector space. So a multiplication by N on a one dimensional vector space has trace N. I see. And the first one. Um, so here, this is the identity. So multiplication by one. Identity, on one. I see. Okay, cool. Yeah. 
All right, let's take a, let's take a two minute break. Sorry, sorry, I missed your request there, Arvin. And then when we come back, we'll start proving um, we'll start proving uh, love shots. So so I'll be right back as well. All right, I'm back. Um, I guess break over. Uh, unless does anyone have any any further questions about this example? All right. If not, um, let me just start with a, a lemma. So now we're going to start sketching the proof. So sketch proof of this left shift's fixed point formula. So, so maybe just a remark before I go on. I mean, so this, this left shift's fixed point formula is also true in topology. So it's true, for example, for manifolds. Um, and the proof, given what we've developed, or at least what we've sketched the development of, is literally the same as in topology. Um, so, so I'm going to state a bunch of lemmas. Um, you know, actually, like there's some some things to check that we haven't done, like checking, for example, the compatibility of the intersection product in Chow and the cut product, um, and checking those things is very technical. But the proof here is is absolutely modeled after the topological proof. Okay, so let's just first start with a lemma. So so in order to understand um, uh, what what's happening here, so suppose we have phi for, which is a map from x to y. So we need to understand how to how to write what it does on cohomology in terms of the graph of phi. So suppose we're given an element of the cohomology of y with say um, say say with uh, with uh, QL coefficients, and we're gonna we're gonna fix and we're gonna fix for all time uh, an isomorphism. QL uh, with QL of one, which also fixes one with QL of n for, for all n. So I'm going to ignore all the all the twists that show up when we do cycle classes. Um, so those twists will go away anyway, uh, which is why this is a safe thing to do. But I, I just want to don't not worry about it. So then the lemma is that the pullback of y through phi, so this is a class on x, can be written as follows. Can be written as the push forward of the class of the graph of phi cupped with the um, with the pullback of y. So here, let me say what what um, what these maps are. So here, here we have uh, x times y. The map to x is called p, and the map to y is called q. Okay. So what's what's the picture of this lemma? So the picture of this, oops. So the picture of this lemma is as follows. Um, so here we have y, here we have x. Um, uh, sorry, maybe let me write it this way. 
here we have x and here we have y. Usually you put the y-axis vertically. Um, and then the graph of a function looks like this. So, so how do we actually like, like realize the function? We, um, you know, given a point of x, you, you go up to the graph and then you project down to y. Okay, so, so what is this saying? It's saying that if you have a, if you have a class on y, it's pullback. Maybe let me draw the graph in a slightly more suggestive way. So here's maybe a, a more suggestive graph. So, so it's saying that if you have a class on y, if you want to see what happens to x, you take its pre-image, that's q upper star of y. Uh, maybe let me actually use a different color. So this is this is q upper star of y here. Um, then you intersect with the graph. So this is the intersection. This is this here is class of the graph. Uh, cupped with Q upper star of Y, and then you take the push forward. So here, these things are, this is uh, the claim, is this is phi star of Y. Okay, so at least pictorially, this is clear, and, and you could actually make this into a, a literal proof in topology. Uh, we we can't in 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 homology because this this class y isn't really represented by a geometric object, um, but but nonetheless the statement is still true, uh, and it, it, in fact it follows just from the definition of push forward here. Um, but so so let me say a couple words about it. Um, yeah. So uh, so how? Should, oh yeah. So so what I wanted to say is I mean this might be something a little bit confusing here, which is that this class of gamma phi doesn't live in the cohomology of x times y. It lives in the cohomology of x times y with coefficients in some twist, right? So, so what happens is why does the twist go away? So, well, if you, if you choose this isomorphism, it goes away, but it canonically goes away because this p lower star also has, has, target, has targeted in, in coefficients with the twist. So you, you, in both cases, you're twisting by the dimension of y. Um, and so those twists cancel each other out. So, so that's why this makes sense as a map from cohomology with QL coefficients to itself. So this is actually like a Galois covariant map. Okay, so I'm gonna leave the proof as an exercise, um, but I'll, I'll say a word about it. So the proof is an exercise, which you should try to do. It's in Milne. You can, you can look at Milne, but, but the content is just the definition it's just the definition of uh, p lower star, so this duality thing, um, plus the projection formula. So this just follows from the properties of, of Geissen maps or, or these push forward maps that I described before. Are there any questions about this lemma? All right, so so we've now so this is this helps us. So this says we can write this pullback in terms of some objects that feel kind of related to like the things we've been doing cohomology with cohomology lately. So in particular, this cup product. So now we want to understand like how to write down this class of a class of a graph here. Um, so so here's the the lemma, and I think I might just have time to state it, and then I'll prove it next time. So. Um, so suppose uh, so suppose E I R is a basis of uh, H R of X um, with coefficients in Q L. So here here for each R I have a basis, um, and let's let uh, F I um, two R, oh, sorry uh, two dimension minus R be the dual basis. of h two dimension minus r x q l of d. Then, um, then the claim is that the cycle class uh, inside of x times x of the graph of phi is equal to the sum uh, of uh, phi star 
EI um, are tensored with F2D minus R I. So here, here this is um, under under the Kunis, under the Kunif. Isomorphism uh, H star X times X QLD with um, H star XQL tensored with H star XQLD. So, so what is this saying? It's saying that. Um, it's, it's saying that uh, this choice of a basis and a dual basis actually gives us a basis of the cohomology of the, of the product, just via Kunif. So EI tensor FI 2D minus R is a, is a basis of this, of, of the, or sorry, EI tensor FJ is the basis of this. And here we, we're writing this, this cycle class in terms of this basis. Okay, so this is, is kind of, it's almost tautological. I'll give the proof next time. Uh, but but I don't think I have time to do it in the remaining three minutes. So let me just write proof next time. This is also doable as an exercise and you should you should give it a try before next time. Um, but yeah, so let me maybe stop there and see if there are any questions. So so from this left shots is going to be almost immediate. So so left shots is kind of formal given given what we've developed. So namely Poincaré duality and this sort of good products of cycle class maps. So I'm going to stop recording. Um, are there any questions?